Man on the Moon, 50 Years On. Here again is Jane Pauley. 50 years ago next weekend, an event truly out of this world. We sent Americans to the moon. We're spending much of the rest of our Sunday morning remembering those remarkable days. With some help from Time Magazine editor-at-large, Jeffrey Kluger, co-author of the book Apollo 13, who remembers it all as if it were yesterday. I've covered space for much of my career. I fell in love with it when I was just a kid. During the summer of 1969, I was at summer camp. It was a camp called, in fact, Camp Comet. And I watched the Apollo 11 mission on a black and white TV along with 200 other kids hanging on to every word from Walter Cronkite. Good morning. It's three hours and 32 minutes until man begins the greatest adventure in his history. On July 16, 1969, three men sat down to a breakfast of steak and eggs. Yeah, they look pretty chipper. Then set off to meet the challenge laid down by President John F. Kennedy seven years before. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Neil Armstrong was the mission commander. Edwin Buzz Aldrin was the lunar module pilot. These men are alike as peas in a pod, and probably different from anyone you've ever known in your life. And Michael Collins was the command module pilot. How did your very distinct personalities complement one another, and did they clash? We never clashed. Uh, I got along very well with uh, Neil and Buzz. Twelve. Eleven. I hark back almost Nine. daily to John F. Mission Kennedy. I felt that we were fulfilling, if successful, his mandate. Three, two, one. I was just Zero. thrilled to be a piece of the whole thing. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, it looks good, Wally. And it remained looking good through the 239,000-mile trip into orbit around the moon. What a moment. Man on the way to the moon. Through the moment when the men split up, Collins staying in lunar orbit in the command module, Armstrong and Aldrin heading to the moon's surface in the lunar module known as Eagle. But when it came time to land, they had to improvise a bit. Our autopilot was taking us into an area that wasn't a good area to land. Armstrong, who died seven years ago, gave a rare interview to Ed Bradley of 60 Minutes in 2005. It was a, a very large crater, about the size of a football stadium, with steep slopes on the crater covered with very large rocks about the size of automobiles. That was not the kind of place I wanted to try to make the first landing. Hey, 75 feet. Looking good, down a half. The worldwide television audience down was watching a simulation following the original flight plan which showed when the lunar module was supposed to touch down. But as the critical moment came, it hadn't actually landed yet. So what did you do? So we uh, took over manually, flew it out further to the west about another half a mile where the lunar surface was much smoother and found a nice spot. You don't have a lot of fuel to do that. Right? No, we were we were running a bit low on fuel. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. The world held its breath. Houston, uh... Oh, jeez. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Oh, boy. Thank you. Whew. Boy. <laughs> okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. We finally landed with, nobody knows exactly how much fuel, but some estimates have it at 20 seconds. Eagle, you are safe for T1. Roger. Then, the moment everyone was waiting for, humanity's first walk on the moon. But who would take that historic first step? The spacewalk protocol on earlier flights called for the junior officer to go outside first, while the commander remained on board. The commander in this case was Armstrong. Buzz Aldrin was the junior man on the moon. The problem was that among those people who were writing the procedures, they knew that this was 
sort of a hot potato. Now 89 years old and making few public appearances, Aldrin also talked with 60 Minutes in 2005. I went into Neil's office and I said, Neil, there is not a decision being made on this. And obviously, I feel that I have to represent a position and I feel that, that you have to, but we do need a decision on this so that we can move on. He said, I understand the historical significance of what's happening, and I'm not going to rule myself out. So he wanted it. Clearly he did, yes. Was it important that you be the first one to step out of the vehicle? Not to me. <laughs> From my point of view, we had both arrived there at the same time. Armstrong said that, in the end, it came down to this. Because of where you were sitting and where the hatch was. Certainly the direction that the hatch was hinged was a significant part of that determination, yes. Armstrong is on the moon, Captain Neil Armstrong. Armstrong's first words, now immortal, were, at the time, a bit confusing. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Walter Cronkite and former astronaut Wally Schirra were perplexed. I didn't understand. <laughs> no, one small step for man, but I didn't get the second phrase. Did you drop the A, small step for a man, or was that lost in transmission? Well, you've listened to me now for a while here, and you've heard me <laughs> drop a lot of syllables, so I certainly can't say that I didn't drop one there, or I may have just goofed. <laughs> Then it was Aldrin's turn down the ladder. I asked him in an interview for Time Magazine two years ago about his first words. Magnificent desolation. Magnificent desolation. You couldn't call that beautiful. It was a, a shabby bunch of dust that hadn't changed in thousands, uh, hundred thousand years. You couldn't find any place on Earth as barren, lifeless. I say that the rocks are rather slippery, very powdery, so uh, tend to slide over it rather easily. Armstrong and Aldrin set about raising an American flag. It turned out to be easier said than done. It would go in about that far, and then it seemed like it was just hitting rock, so we were p pounding on it, and finally uh, we got it to be upright. As for Michael Collins, he remained in orbit, checking in with NASA. Yeah, radio line clear. How's it going? Roger, the EVA is progressing beautifully. They're setting up the flag now. As Collins circled the far side of the moon, he would be completely out of touch. Even when he was flying over his fellow astronauts, he couldn't see what the rest of the world was watching. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. That's all right, I don't mind a bit. Do you at all regret not having closed that final 60 miles and left? Collins' boot prints on the moon. No, uh, uh, I'd be a, a liar or a fool if I said I had the best seat on Apollo 11, but I felt that I was an important part of it. Uh, when I was behind the moon, uh, I later discovered I was being described as, oh, lonely, lonely, lonely. I was happy back there. I had my own little domain actually going down and touching the moon. Yeah, that was not, uh, not high on my list. It has a start. As Armstrong and Aldrin carried out their scientific experiments, they seemed to be having fun. They're having a lot more motion than we anticipated. They're romping around up there. That's right. The slow movement that had been predicted hasn't taken place. After two hours and 31 minutes walking on the moon, it was time to go home. Head on up the ladder, Buzz. Time there, he just leaped up on the step. He's left the moon's surface. Buzz does have a first. He's the first man to leave the moon. <laughs> and then the first man on the moon became the second to leave it. There he goes. Look at that leap. He went up a couple wow. of steps in the one leap. The lunar module blasted off. The three crew members were reunited. You open that hatch and they're your friends. Were. Oh, absolutely. I was absolutely delighted to him. I was about to kiss Buzz Aldrin on the forehead and I decided maybe, no, no, I think history books wouldn't like that. It was a wonderful instant in time. It took just under three days to return to Earth. Apollo 11, and splash down in the Pacific. 
I think the best was uh, seeing those three beautiful parachutes open and knowing we were going to splat, but uh, successfully, a successful splat. And here they come. The astronauts went straight into three weeks of quarantine, but still their mission wasn't over. Gee, you look great. You feel as good as oh, you look. feel great. feel just perfect, Mr. Yeah. President. The public affairs guy, he said, well, we got some things for you to do. There's this uh, round the world trip, and uh, you don't have to go if you don't want to. My God, how could anyone say that? Around the world, 650 million people had watched every step of their journey. Now the world wanted to see, in person, the first men to walk on the moon. I was flabbergasted. Uh, I thought that when we went someplace, they'd say, well, congratulations, you Americans uh, finally did it. And instead of that, unanimously, the reaction was, we did it. We humans finally left this planet. We did it. The date's now indelible. It's going to be remembered as long as man survives. July 20th, 1969 the day man reached and walked on the moon.